Hello and welcome to part 3 of my series about the evolution of Roman naming practices. Don't forget to watch part 1 and 2 to learn the basic terminology and to understand how Roman names worked during the times of the Republic and the early Empire. Today we'll be talking about how the naming customs changed from the 3rd to the 6th century AD and what were the key factors for those changes. By the start of the 3rd century, Rome was a huge multi-ethnic empire. Its population was divided into three major classes, the slaves, the free provincial subjects or peregrini, and the citizens. The primary indicator of citizenship was Roman name. As we saw in the previous video, different social classes used it differently, but they all understood its significance. For the Italians and their descendants in the provinces, it was proof of their ancestry and the connection to the great city. For the ex peregrini who earned citizenship through military service, it was the symbol of their achievement. But in 212 AD, all free subjects of the empire were granted citizenship. The famous Constitutia Antoniniana, or the Edict of Caracalla, as it is conventionally known, created tens of millions of new Roman citizens overnight. It may sound like a good thing at first, but at a closer inspection, the picture wasn't as rosy. Its economic effects are a topic for another video, so in this one we will only discuss the edict's effects on the naming practices. Before this law was passed, the newly enfranchised imperial subjects had to undergo at least some exposure to the Roman way of life before receiving citizenship. The most popular way was through their service in the exilia, the military units composed of non-citizens. This meant that by interacting with imperial bureaucracy, they would get some basic understanding of how the system is supposed to work. The edict swept that assimilation process aside. In the previous video, I used the term New Romans in reference to the enfranchised Peregrini and described how their way of dealing with the Roman naming system was different from that of the old elite. The edict of Caracalla basically created a class of even newer Romans. These people now all had Roman names, but had no idea how they were supposed to work. Keeping with the Roman tradition of adopting the sponsor's name, tens of millions of ex peregrini got the emperor's praenomen and nomen. Those were Marcus and Aurelius, since Caracalla adopted the name Marcus Aurelius Antoninus when his father became the emperor. Now every provincial peasant was Marcus Aurelius, and every peasant's wife was Aurelia. By this time, the praenomen was being phased out from the common people's names, so the name Marcus didn't make much impact. Aurelius, on the other hand, became the most common nomen overnight. In the Latin West, the proportion of citizens prior to the edict was considerably higher, so for the time being, Aurelius remained second place to the well-established Iulius. But in the Greek-speaking East, you couldn't swing a dead cat without hitting an Aurelius. On the inscriptions from 210, only 5% of listed men have the nomen Aurelius. On a similar inscription from 227, it's 95%. In the Greek-speaking world of that period, the standard naming convention was personal name plus patronymic, usually with the suffix O, which meant of. For example, Papontos Carnelio meant Papontos, son of Carnelius. After the Edict of Caracalla, the native Greeks simply stuck Aurelius in front of their names and didn't change anything else. It became so ubiquitous that local scribes used it as the indicator of citizenship. It is evident from the contemporary documents, like the list of soldiers from the Cohorts 20 Palmyrenorum. Scribe gives the name Aurelius even to the soldiers who clearly had citizenship before 212. We can figure out who was already a citizen and who got it from Caracalla by examining the structure of the names. Those for whom Aurelius is followed by nomen and cognomen are in the first category, and those who have a cognomen and a patronymic are in the second. Curious cases are soldiers who have their praenomen and cognomen listed, like Gaius Germanus and Marcus Victor. These few probably had the nomen Aurelius before the edict, so the scribe didn't like the combination Aurelius Aurelius and rearranged the parts of their names to be more aesthetically pleasing. With popularity like that, the name Marcus Aurelius was destined to come back to the imperial palace 
even after the Severan dynasty was extinguished. Indeed, when Galienus removed the senatorial monopoly on major military commands, this combination made its way back from the barracks to the highest office. Six out of nine emperors between Galienus and Diocletian bore the name Marcus Aurelius. In 284 AD, a cavalry commander, Gaius Valerius Diocles, became the Roman Emperor. It may not be obvious, but his name didn't fit his new office. Diocles was a dead giveaway that the man was a low-born provincial. This is why he changed his name to Diocletianus. The man, who we now know as the Emperor Diocletian, also appointed his friend, Marcus Aurelius Maximianus, as co-emperor. They proclaimed each other to be brothers and exchanged nomina. The elder brother was to be Gaius Aurelius Valerius Diocletianus, and the younger, Marcus Aurelius Valerius Maximianus. They also enhanced their names with Signa, or the nicknames. Signum was becoming more popular as a part of a Roman name, as the nomen was fading out. Diocletian nicknamed himself Iovius, or Jupiter, and Maximian became Herculius. In 293, they got two more colleagues, Galerius Maximianus and Flavius Constantius. It would have been very inconvenient to exchange all four nomina, so instead each of the new Caesars adopted the nomen Valerius and the praenomen of his direct superior. Galerius became Gaius Galerius Valerius Maximianus and Constantius became Marcus Flavius Valerius Constantius. So Valerius was now the nomen of imperial dignity. During this period, we see this name shoot up in popularity throughout the empire. Its usage, however, was very peculiar. It doesn't work like traditional nomen gentilicum. Instead, it is given together with an imperial rank. It's passed from father to son only if the said rank is also hereditary, and is stripped away whenever the rank is. Valerius is effectively the first high-status nomen, the role in which it was soon going to be eclipsed by the much more ubiquitous Flavius. Ten years later, Diocletian and Maximian abdicated, and Constantius died soon after. The tetrarchy was beginning to fall apart. In these uncertain times, Rome got another man who was willing to make his name a propaganda tool, the son of Constantius, young Flavius Constantinus. First, Constantine needed to pose as a legitimate member of the tetrarchy, so he became Marcus Flavius Valerius Constantinus. After dealing with his immediate rival Maxentius, Constantine started to downplay the connection to the so-called Herculean dynasty, since it was seen as junior to the Jovian dynasty of his eastern colleague Licinius. He dropped the dynastic praenomen Marcus, and for his elder sons he even omitted the nomen Valerius. This way he stressed his legitimacy as a biological son of Constantius, rather than a member of Tetrarchy. After Constantine dealt with Licinius, the nomen Flavius became the undisputed sole signifier of imperial connection. Same as Valerius before it, the name Flavius was now adopted by most of the people who entered imperial service. Soon it displaced Iulius as the second most common nomen after Aurelius. In the Christian epigraphy of Rome and Carthage, the ratio between Aurelius and Flavius is 11 to 4 but all of Flavi were of high status, while Aureli were mostly commoners. The names became so synonymous with status that scribes started to draft up loan contracts with the names for lender and borrower, already filled in as Flavius and Aurelius. The emperors of the rest of the 4th, 5th and 6th centuries were almost all men of the new aristocracy, the ones who owed their status not to the old senatorial rank, but to the service in the new imperial system. That is why all of them, with little exception, have nomen Flavius. The new imperial nobility even developed its own version of polyonymy that was different from that of the old senatorial class. In the previous video, we saw that the remnants of the senatorial elite maintained their naming system based on the old tria nomina. Some even kept a prior nomen after the 6th century. The new imperial nobility didn't have ancient pedigrees and centuries of familial connections to draw upon. 
Instead, they simply added the cognomina of their forebearers to their name. Bishop Gregory of Tours, for example, is Georgius Florentius Gregorius. This full name commemorates his father Florentius and his grandfather Georgius. This practice, combined with the tradition of naming sons after grandfathers, obviously resulted in some repetitions. It didn't take long for this system to produce a Flavius Strategius Apion Strategius Apion, the consul for 539 AD. However, as silly as this name may sound, at least it is easy to decipher. This can't be said about a name like Flavius Anastasius Paulus Probus Sabinianus Pompeius Anastasius, the consul of 517. He was a grandnephew of the Emperor Anastasius, but the other four of his names can't be attributed without knowing the exact genealogy. Seems like figuring out ways to give yourself a ridiculously long name is a very popular Roman noble custom. When we are talking about the Roman names in late antiquity, we can't go without mentioning the period's biggest cultural development, the empire's conversion to Christianity. Surprisingly, it didn't have a dramatic effect on the naming practices. It increased the popularity of biblical names like Johannes, Maria and Thomas, as well as Greek-style Christian-themed names like Anastasius, Bonifatius, Theodosius. But these names were organically integrated into the established custom and used as new cognomina, the exact same way that the native names were used in Rome throughout history. Christians even developed a practice similar to status nomen. In a way similar to the secular Marcus and Aurelius, they used the word Abba to refer to the members of the clergy. Abba means father, so this custom is actually alive to this day. Christian trends also found their way into aristocratic polyonomy. From around 500 AD, we start seeing the so-called devotional cognomina. Roman nobility, both in the East and in the West, started to add the names of archangels, apostles and saints to their own. One such example is Flavius Marianus Michaelius Gabrielus Petrus Johannes Narcis Aurelianus Limenius Stephanus Aurelianus. You see that before his actual secular name comes the multiple commemorations of the biblical figures. This custom had its own special rules. The devotional part had to come before the secular name, and the names within it were arranged in order of theological precedence. The aspects of divinity before the Holy Virgin, the Virgin before the Archangels, the Archangels before the Apostles, and the Apostles before ordinary saints and martyrs. So this was the state of Roman naming customs at around the middle of the 6th century. Quite a lot of developments had occurred in the three centuries from the Edict of Caracalla. Some of those were caused by societal changes, while others were consequences of the actions of powerful men. In the next part, we will witness the eclipse of the unique Roman naming system, as the Eastern Roman Empire joins the rest of the Christian world in returning to the Binomial Convention. If you have some remaining questions, feel free to ask them in the comments. Thanks a lot for watching till the end, and I will see you in the next one.